Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're going to cover the earnings for AMD, Lattice, and Arista Networks. We'll jump right into AMD's financial results. This company reported $5.4 billion in revenue, which is an 18% year-over-year decrease. Some of the big news is regarding their market segments. Data center revenue was down 11% year-over-year. Gaming revenue down 4%. Embedded up 16% year over year, but client revenue was down 54% year over year, $998 million for this segment. Nick, let's talk a little bit more about what is going on at AMD. So, Casey, yeah, the second quarter was a bit uglier than expected. And the outlook, which we'll get to momentarily, was, I would say, just thoroughly okay. I have a mini rant about that at the end of, of this bit, but the segment breakdown client group, that's PCs and laptops. Remember excess inventory is the story here. This was a big disappointment for AMD because Intel reported a really big rebound in the second quarter and said that they will continue to rebound throughout the second half of the year. So it looks like Intel is actually clawing back some of the PC and laptop market share that it lost to AMD over the last few years. And it's something for us to watch going forward. Is this partly by design because AMD made that big pivot to the embedded segment? That's the Xilinx acquisition, the FPGA chips. That acquisition was finished in February, 2022. So maybe it's by design, AMD just pulling back from PCs and laptops a bit to focus on enterprise and data center and such. But nonetheless, that, that was the big drag in this quarter. Data center, it's important to think of this in kind of two separate sub-segments. You have data center and more traditional high-performance compute cloud, let's say, workloads. And now you have this new generative AI hype cycle. The generative AI hype cycle is a positive for AMD. But even in the more traditional cloud, high-performance compute segment of data center, there was actually some weakness there this quarter as well, which is, again, to be expected. Gaming, Microsoft, Xbox, PlayStation uh, 5 sales were good, offset by PC gaming revenue. Embedded, the Xilinx acquisition still doing well, but we're headed for a downturn in that the second half of 2023. Very much a mixed bag for AMD. Overall, I would say... Just an okay report, maybe slightly leaning towards a bit underwhelming for me. I think there was a lot of hope going into this with NVIDIA's most recent quarterly earnings release. They expect another $4 billion in revenue in their next quarter earnings report. And so AMD, as you said, very underwhelming with the data center segment. Intel and AMD currently skew a little bit more towards the traditional data center CPUs versus NVIDIA and the high-performance GPUs. AMD now shifting away from those more traditional CPUs and shifting their focus into high-performance GPUs. Do you think this is going to take a long time to take effect? Yes, I think the shift is happening. Does that mean they completely am abandon their more traditional markets? Probably not. We're just going to have to see how that plays out. But this is my mini rant because so many investors, I think, had this expectation that NVIDIA was going to get some really robust competition immediately, less than a quarter after the mind-blowing once-in-a-lifetime moment where they <laughs> report $4 billion in sequential growth, more than 50% growth entirely from this new generative AI market. This is, I hate the analogy, the iPhone moment, but it's also appropriate in one very important way. NVIDIA has been developing this new end market for at least a decade and a half. Of course, no one is going to be able to narrow that gap in less than a few months time. Of course they're not. NVIDIA helped create this market. They helped pioneer it. They have a very large lead. Yes, they are going to have competitors that pop up and eventually take market share. That's just the natural progression of things, but it's not going to happen quickly. 
So that was a very false, very wrong expectation that investors had of AMD, really an unfair expectation. So I think maybe that's part of the disappointment that maybe some have in this AMD report. But I will say this, things are still looking positive for AMD. CEO Lisa Su did mention that engagements with customers on their newest AI chips and the software that they've been developing. Casey, you and I did a nice little overview of what the new AMD AI software stack looks like at least a month ago. They're making progress. So a 7x increase in engagements, that doesn't automatically mean 7x revenue in AI. They're just engagements. So lots of customer interest. Again, a very natural thing after NVIDIA just absolutely obliterated, sent the ball sailing out of the park. Of course, there are going to be customer engagements for AMD, but it's simply just going to take time to turn into revenue. So that was positive. And it also looks like the second half of 2023 data center revenue will be up. AMD management thinks roughly 50% compared to the first half of 2023. So 2.6 billion in data center revenue, the first half of 2023, that could be headed to roughly 3.9 billion the second half of the year. Positive overall, but AMD is no NVIDIA. That's an unfair expectation. Another interesting comment made by the CEO, Lisa Su, she said that the market for AI accelerators will reach over 150 billion by 2027. And currently the estimates for 2022 are around 20 billion to 30 billion. So this would be a exponential increase over the coming years. So it seems like there's a lot of room for multiple companies to take a share in this. Yeah, Casey, you're absolutely right. It's worth mentioning that's not just one single chip type. These servers have a lot of different chips. So yes, you're absolutely correct. And folks, keep that in mind, what Casey just said. A lot of companies will have a share in this, not just NVIDIA, not just AMD, not just Intel, because there's lots of parts and pieces that go into an AI server. Will that estimate pan out? 150 billion? It's a wild estimate. Casey, who knows? I think we're throwing darts at the wall right now, trying to figure out how big this generative AI thing will be. But let's just say it's going to be big and AMD will probably pick up a fair amount of new revenue from it. And just one other small point before we move on to valuation for AMD. We're going to be talking about Lattice Semiconductor, which is an FPGA company. But AMD, of course, is a big competitor with the acquisition of Xilinx. And AMD released enhanced versions of their Vivado and Vitus software platforms. So those are the software platforms that actually helps you program these chips in the field. They're making a lot of headway in this specific space as well. FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, used in data centers, but a lot of other things as well. So the automotive industry, a top consumer, aerospace and def defense space, this is like an ancillary play on the space industry here, all sorts of things. Casey, one thing that's really interesting about this is those Xilinx chips, now AMD embedded chips, FPGAs, actually get used by companies like Cadence Design Systems. Check out our earnings review of them. Cadence has a hardware segment where they use these FPGAs and get sold to companies that are testing and emulating chips before they go on to mass production because of the way you're able to reprogram these logic gates to emulate something a bit more application specific. So a cool way AMD is able to get a backdoor into some of these AI applications for the data center, but also automotive and other things too. Okay, let's move on to the stock price and valuation. Currently it's at $117 or thereabouts. The PE ratio is over 500, crazy. But what is our fair value and valuation for this company, Nick? Yes, a PE of roughly 500, not meaningful whatsoever. Trailing 12-month earnings per share is not meaningful here because AMD is in the midst of a very deep slump, not very profitable over the last year. So 
throw that out the window and trying to figure out your actual estimates on where AMD should be. We have to look at the future. So let's go back to the last peak earning cycle for AMD, which you look back over the last couple of years, 2021, 2022, earnings per share peaked at just over three bucks per share. Let's say sometime next year, AMD gets back to that $3 mark. Maybe by the end of 2024, they're back to the $3, maybe even plus earnings per share. So let's do a reverse engineer of the fair value. Let's say 118 is the fair value. What is the market's estimate for growth? So assuming earnings per share goes back to three bucks next year, and then let's assume 20% earnings per share growth after that for 2025 and 2026, right, roughly in line with Lisa Sue's prediction on the AI accelerator market that you mentioned. And then after that, six and a half percent terminal growth in, into perpetuity using a 10% discount rate that gets us to roughly 118 bucks per share. So Casey, that's the estimate. I think that's a fairly reasonable expectation for AMD. I think we're at fair value at the moment. I still don't think this is a bad stock. I think we have a full position in our portfolio, so we're not adding here, but for those investors that are maybe looking for a way to invest in this AI hype, but in a way that's not ridiculously overpriced, I still think AMD is not a bad option to go. At least that's my take. Okay, let's move on to Lattice Semiconductor. This company is like a baby Xilinx. It's a very small company with a second quarter revenue record of $190 million, which is up 3% sequentially and 18% year over year. This company has had their 13th consecutive quarter of sequential revenue growth. Earnings per share on an adjusted basis, $0.52 cents per share, which represents a 24% year-over-year growth. Did Interestingly, Casey, on an unadjusted basis, GAP, earnings were $0.36 cents versus $0.32. Cents. So we've done a couple of videos on Lattice now. We know this company is investing very heavily in new products. And so I think for investors looking at earnings on a GAP basis, you're probably scratching your head wondering, what is this garbage business? Revenue is soaring, but GAP earnings are not growing nearly as quickly. I think bear that in mind. This is a small company. They're the last FPGA pure play, at least one that trades publicly. After AMD acquired Xilinx, Intel acquired a couple of FPGA companies. So Lattice is the last player standing here in the FPGA market. Very small form factor FPGAs, and they're moving up market into larger form factors. So they're starting to maybe at least have aspirations to trample on the turf of AMD slash Xilinx and Intel. And so that's where the slower, sluggish looking gap earnings are coming from. Q2, they paid off $60 million in debt and then finished off the remaining $45 million of outstanding debt. So the company is now completely debt-free. And cash on the balance sheet, $104 million. So pretty well set up, right, Nick? Yeah, absolutely. And they're actually forecasting more sequential growth, up to $197 million expected for Q3 versus the $190 million just reported for Q2. It's a pretty amazing run for this small business. It's not a small cap. If we want to be technical, it's considered a mid-cap stock, but this is really a tiny business in comparison to its peers. What do you like about this company? Because I know this is one of your favorites. You've done a lot of digging into this and you've got it on your dollar cost average list because you like it for the long term. Tell the viewers what's up. What do you like? For the first thing is I really like the CEO, James Anderson. He came from AMD, so he's very familiar with his biggest competitor, AMD, with the Xilinx acquisition. Very personable guy, and he really is excited about his products. Speaking about some of their products regarding the Nexus and the Avant, they've expanded that product offering. They have now six in the Nexus line. Just last quarter, they have five. And 
as you can see, they are planning on releasing even more in the coming months and years. This company has fit margin expansion almost every quarter for many years now. In regards to the markets that this company serves, as Nick mentioned, industrial, electrification of everything, data centers. In the earnings call, the CEO mentioned that a lot of those revenue streams that Lattice has right now are fresh revenue streams. All of these new revenue streams for Lattice, they're just at the beginning stages and there's only growth from here. And another thing that we pointed out in our last video for Lattice was software attach. So whenever a company buys a piece of silicon from Lattice, about 50% of the time they're using one of their software solution stacks. So at 50%, they have a ton of room for growth in having customers adopt their software solution stack with their products. They also released a new software stack called Lattice Drive just in July for the automotive industry as well. Right, which is a big deal, Casey, as we talked about in that last video on Lattice. Historically, FPGAs, not the easiest of chips to implement because not only do you have to know the hardware side, but if you want to reprogram it, which is the reason why you would buy an FPGA in the first place, you have to know the software as well. So I like that point that you keep hammering down on pretty hard, this company expanding into software, but in, in a unique way. It's not an EDA company. It's not a cadence or a synopsis, but the interesting software play here to make their chips easier to sell. It's a compelling benefit for a customer maybe comparing Xilinx versus these new FPGA products from Lattice. And that obviously, as those new product lines scale up, Casey, you mentioned the persistently expanding profit margins. It's unbelievable to think about this company could still continue to put up higher and higher profit margins, but that's what we're looking at and what we're expecting in the coming, say, three to five years. Nick, we've talked about this before with Lattice. It's an expensive stock. Currently, share price is around $93 today. What is our valuation and price target for this stock? We love that. We love that word, expensive stock. Yeah, over 60 times trailing 12-month earnings. But it's a growth business, profit margin expansion business. So you get the dual tailwind there. But Casey, similar to AMD and what we're going to do at the very end with Arista Networks is what's do the reverse engineering of what are the expectations if the current share price of 93 bucks today as of this recording is justified. So here's what we've got plugged in here, folks. 93 bucks a share today, earnings per share estimate of $1.50. That's our estimate for this current year, 2023, buck fifty gap earnings per share. So if you're a traditional value investor, we are using gap here. So a buck 50 earnings per share growth of 15% through 2025. So for the next two years, earnings per share growth of 15% and then an 8% terminal growth rate thereafter using a 10% discount rate. That gets us to that roughly 90 bucks per share range. Those are the expectations if you think it's fair valued at $93. Casey, this is another one. I think, yes, it is expensive, which is going to always create a high amount of volatility, right? I think that's what investors really fear when you buy a, an expensive premium, premium price stock. What it ultimately means is you're going to have a higher rate of volatility than on market average. That's what we're looking at. We think it's actually pretty reasonable expectation given this company's track record. It's still pretty small size versus its very large peers, predominantly Intel and AMD. So it's a dollar cost average stock for us. That's what we're looking at anyways. Casey, closing, closing comments on Lattice? No, I think everyone knows how I feel about Lattice Semiconductor. So let's move on to Arista Networks. Nick, Arista Networks is not a company that I have followed in the past. So can you give us a brief rundown of what this company does and maybe the earnings numbers? Oh, you haven't followed it. This is actually one we've owned for a long time. And it's been a 
an awesome investment, a bumpy investment, but overall fantastic growth. So think Arista Networks. So first off, this is not a semiconductor business. Arista does not design chips, but they do use chips and components. They're an engineer. Think of them as an engineer for the network communications and data center information highway. So everything from the internet itself to the cloud, to maybe data centers that are not part of the cloud, they're for private use. It's a company's own internal network. Arista helps those companies engineer those. And specifically the pieces of hardware that they design and sell that makes up their actual revenue, the bulk of their actual revenue are routers and switches. So these are like the actual individual building blocks of that information highway. As you might expect, the cloud, now AI training happening in data centers, thanks to NVIDIA, you would think, yes, a company like Arista is probably doing pretty well. And you'd be absolutely correct. Q2 2023 revenue, 1.46 billion, up 39% year over year. Earnings per share on a gap basis, up 65%, or on an adjusted basis, up 46% year over year. All the classic signs you want to see of a company growing rapidly and scaling, you have the profit margins growing at a faster rate. And again, another dual tailwind for us as shareholders. It was a great quarter. Who are some of the competitors for Arista Networks? I think the big one that you have to know about to get a general understanding of what this industry segment looks like is Cisco, the really old networking company of yesteryear, still very large, still doing just fine. They've made more pivots recently towards cloud software, but that's the leader in like these infrastructure bits, networking, internet infrastructure, parts for data centers, switches, routers, and such. I think that's the big one that if you're unfamiliar with Arista Networks and this kind of engineering space, learn about Cisco. Okay, got it. Arista has had rapid growth over the last few years. On this slide, it says Arista's growth drivers addressing 51 billion in total addressable market. So it looks like they have a lot of room for growth. Yeah, they certainly do, Casey, not just because it's a big market. And that's an important point because this growth rate that they report and continuously report now for years implies that they keep scooping up share of that market that they do address. But in addition to that, they really focus on two main areas. The first are what they call cloud titans. So two of their biggest customers pretty consistently for years now are Microsoft and Meta. They do a lot of engineering work and sell a lot of routers and switches for Microsoft and Meta data centers. Meta, of course, being Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp. Yes, they do actually operate their own infrastructure. So that whole cloud computing space, data centers being the basic compute unit of the cloud and cloud delivered services, a high growth market in addition to the company scooping up market share. And of course, I have to ask, how will Arista Networks be affected by AI? Oh, you can bet they're going to be affected by AI, <laughs> like everybody else likes to claim. But really, it is an interesting development because now suddenly they have to almost split their cloud titans segment, the largest, most important segment versus enterprise that is basically all non-cloud data centers and infrastructure. That cloud titan segment now has to be split between more traditional cloud compute and now suddenly this new AI-driven, generative AI-driven cloud compute segment. So some interesting dynamics going on here. Like we talked about with AMD, the more traditional data center segment slowing down for AMD and then AI ramping up, Arista is actually still growing in both. So if the more traditional cloud is actually still going pretty strong, but it is leveling out a bit because some of those top customers, Microsoft and Meta, are taking a step back and trying to figure out, okay, what's the right mix of our normal cloud compute workload infrastructure and this newer generative AI thing? What's the right balance? So 
the 39% growth the company just reported in Q2 is not going to continue the back half of 2023. Their growth rate for full year 2023 is going to be 30% or more, which implies Q3 and Q4 revenue growth is going to dip below 30% on a year-over-year basis. Okay. So I think that's important. But this new wave of AI has really opened the door to a new era of data center infrastructure upgrades. So again, if you think of these just simply as the highways and exchanges onto and off of the highways, what does AI do to that? Basically, you need more lanes. So you need to increase the width of the highway and the freeway. And then you also need to increase the speed limit as well. That's basically what's going on here. So there's like this new wave of innovation happening and Arista is really at the heart of it all. Nick, can you tell me a little bit about the Ultra Ethernet Consortium? I can barely spit that out. Okay, there's an acronym for that. UEC, Ultra Ethernet Consortium. This was just announced in July and Arista Networks is one of the founding members of it, along with AMD, Broadcom, Cisco, Intel, Meta, and Microsoft, HP Enterprise. You like Lattice's CEO. I really like Arista Network's CEO, Jayshree Olal. Awesome. Superstar CEO that very few people know about. I'm just going to quote her here about this UEC. So she says on the earnings call in response to an analyst, today I would say in the back end of the network, there are basically three classes of networks. One is very small networks that are within a server where customers use PCIe, CXL, proprietary NVIDIA specific te technologies like NVLink that Arista does not participate in. Then there's more medium clusters. You can think generative AI clusters, mostly inference, where they may well get built on Ethernet. For the extremely large clusters with large language training models, so that's the third, the third thing, she's the third class of network she's talking about, especially with the advent of chat GPT, GPT-3 and 4, you're not talking about not just billion parameters, but an aggregate of trillions of parameters. And this is where Ethernet will shine. But today, the only technology that is available to customers is InfiniBand, which that's Mellanox. NVIDIA acquired that a few years ago. So obviously, InfiniBand, with 10, 15 years of similarity in an HPC, high-performance compute environment, is often being bundled with the GPU. But the right long-term technology is Ethernet, which is why I'm so proud of what the Ultra Ethernet Consortium, UEC, and a number of vendors are doing to make that happen. So near term, there's going to be a lot of InfiniBand and Arista will be watching that outside in. Okay, let me sum that up. UEC was founded to basically address this next gen connective tissue, the highways and the roads and whatnot within a data center as all these GPUs get crammed in there. NVIDIA benefiting a great deal from that, but UEC was developed to come up with something better because Ethernet for these really large clusters and connecting them with highways needs a new, more modern Ethernet connection, cables, basically. So that's what Arista is working on there. And this could be a really big growth driver for them that continues not just the next couple of years, but really, I think, for the next five to 10 years as these companies try to figure out and tweak their data centers, their supercomputers, how to make them operate as efficiently as they possibly can for this tidal wave after tidal wave of data that keeps coming in for AI and such. Okay, let's do our reverse engineer of the share price of 183 today. All right. Our estimate for earnings per share on a gap basis is about six bucks. So if we want to get a fair value of roughly 180, 183, where it's at as we record this. Basically, what we need is something like earnings per share growth of 10% for two years through 2025, and then 6% terminal growth thereafter, 10% discount rate. Actually, ends up with a fair value of about 170 to 180. This looks like a pretty pedestrian expectation, if you ask me, if you're willing to buy and hold this thing for the next decade. But that's the boat we've been in. We've bought and hold this thing for the better part of the last decade. This was a new company that IPO'd in the early 2010s, but it's been an amazing stock 
since we bought it, haven't sold a single share, have continued to butt nibble here and there along the way. Yes, it looks like a premium price right now where it's at. So if you need to sandbag, consider doing a dollar cost average or something like that. But I think that's where the expectations are really. And it looks very modest to me. I think this is very achievable for Aresta. Casey, you, what do you think? You've sold me on it. I'm glad that we have it in our portfolio. And thank you for helping me and the viewers understand what this company does, because it sounds like it is a very valuable company and has a lot of opportunity in coming years, especially with AI. Our next video will be a new chip war is emerging for energy independence on semi monolithic power and Albemarle. Make sure you hit the subscribe button, share this video, and we will see you back here very soon with our next video.